Romans chapter 11, let me um, prepare you before we read the entire chapter and then we'll give six points to kind of outline the chapter uh, expositionally before we disperse today. Now, we are living in some incredible times. I will preface this with any man or woman that says a date in which Jesus Christ will return, has been strictly forbidden in the scripture for ever doing so when Jesus Christ said, nobody knows the day or the hour. However, through not hundreds, thousands of prophecies, we do and can discern as Jesus Christ would rebuke the Pharisees, saying that you can predict weather patterns but you cannot discern the signs in the times of the Messiah. And he would even tell them that your, your, your children will be cursed because of this. Jerusalem will be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. Not one stone upon another will stand. And so, it is incumbent upon us that we also are aware of the signs in the times. And just remember... You know, I, I spend four or five months, six months now in the States per year because of the missions organization that we started here in, in, in Africa, headquartered here at our church, Great Commission Ministries. And it grieved my heart to see so many around the world believing the lies of CNN concerning the nation of Israel during the conflict with Palestine. Understand we believe the teaching of the Bible, that God has a covenant with the nation of Israel. It is an everlasting covenant, and it is especially logically uh, inaccurate to compare the nation of Israel with the terrorists of uh, uh, Palestinians. It, it is just wrong. And uh, I don't care if that's offensive. It's simply true. And because of this, it burdened my heart to want to spend several weeks discussing prophecy as the last time we did was the second book of the Bible that we teached in the history of our church here, which was back in 2013 when we went verse by verse through the book of Revelation when we were still in town. The... Um, It's about 27, depending on who you ask, 27, but certainly anywhere from 24 to 27%, some say as many as 30%, if you include aspects of prophecy, 30% of the Bible is talking about prophecy. Much of those prophecies, in fact, thousands concerning the nation of Israel, when I returned from the States a few months ago, we spent several weeks discussing prophecy as we went through the Ezekiel 38 war and the 70 weeks of Daniel found in Daniel chapter 9. And when we did that, we learned in Ezekiel 38 that there was going to be a collaboration of nations that would come against Israel in the end times. We also learned there was a prophecy given in the scripture that though the nation of Israel would be dispersed at 70 AD, they would be dispersed as a nation no longer inhabiting uh, the promised land that was given to them by God. But one day, the nation of Israel would return being recognized by the nations around the world as a nation once again. Now, those brothers in Christ that do not take prophecy literally, um, as they study scripture, including Bible commentators, preachers, and scholars, they should have repented of not approaching scripture with a historical, grammatical, hermeneutical approach. Hermeneutic simply means the way we interpret. And we need to approach it with a her historical, grammatical approach. That simply means we believe it literally. That when it says the nation of Israel is going to become a nation, 
recognized by all the world nations once again, that that's going to happen. Many took it as non-literal for hundreds of years. They should have repented of that in March 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation again. And they should have repented of any prophetic views that were figurative or metaphorical. These things have happened literally. Now, in the modern state of Israel, there are prophecies concerning Israel in the last days that a group of nations, two primary nations, would come against Israel. These nations have never been at war with modern Israel. Please listen. When we discussed this a few weeks ago, these two primary nations have never been at war with Israel since 1948 in modern Israel. Never. In fact, they've never been at war with Israel uh, um, formally uh, since 70 AD. And since we ended our prof prophetic teachings and study in the Bible just a few weeks ago and returned back to the study of the book of Romans... Iran and Israel are in open war that is evident to the entire world. You should just gasp in your seat. This is incredible. Now, listen, I don't know the day or the hour. Russia hasn't joined the fight yet. I, I, I don't uh, pretend to try to dramatize it to the point where Jesus is returning right now or tomorrow or giving predictions as foolish men and women have, but it would be a mistake not to recognize prophetic fulfillment in the last couple weeks. It would be a mistake. I don't, guys, don't think that this is good timing for me. It's like, man, he's a genius. What good timing? When he did his study a couple weeks ago, they weren't at war, and after his study is ended, they're at war. No, no, no. It is mentioned repeatedly in Scripture. Before we get into reading this whole chapter, two things that should be our response, two very important things. Number one is repentance. If you think you have time, you are wrong on many levels. First of all, you're not promised tomorrow you could die today. Second of all, as we're going to study, God could give you a spirit, a spirit of stupor just because you rebelled today. And, and, and third, Jesus could rapture through mass evacuation his church today and the world is going to just, be, it's going to be in turmoil. You know, the Bible says there's going to be earthquakes and floods during the end times. Now, I know if you get into the study, as I have, there has been floods and there has been pastors saying, see, there's floods. Like I said, I don't know the day or the hour, but I know that large parts of China in the last couple weeks are completely flooded. Did you guys hear about this? The entire city of Dubai is flooded. We as Christians, of all people, should not be ignorant of the times that we are living in. Israel, if, uh, if you don't, you know, you, you think about Russia, we're just waiting for Russia to join the conflict. To become the leading nation that leads an actual battle on a particular day that we don't know against the nation of Israel, along with a collaboration of nations, the two uh, 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 greatest ones is Russia and Iran. Some other nations you can speculate on. These two you can't. Did you know that Israel was bombing near the nuclear facilities of Iran just last week? Those nuclear facilities that are being run by Russians? This is not a coincidence. 
God knowing the end from the beginning, he's the alpha, the and omega, he has predicted such things. He knows them. So it should cause us to repent. Number two, brothers and sisters, it should cause us to evangelize, not to be worried. Now, if you're in sin, you should be worried, but then you can just repent and receive God's mercy. But we ought to evangelize. If I were somehow a prophet, which I am not, uh, and God revealed to me, which he has not, that there was a nuclear bomb going to blow up Eldoret tomorrow, would you not go and tell everybody you know? Would you not tell your family and your friends and your colleagues? And Gosh, you would even tell strangers. For you Christians, you would even tell your enemies. You're like, no, I really don't like you, but just so you know, if you stay here, you're going to die. Why? Be because it's such an in in uh, uh, impending threat. The destruction coming upon our world during the tribulation period is a greater threat than a nuclear bomb blowing up Eldoret. It is a shaking of the entire planet where asteroids and earthquakes and demonic oppression, all through God's judgment comes upon this world and we ought to warn every single person about the coming judgment, tell them about their sin and then the greatest news, tell them about Jesus Christ who loves them enough for them to be born again. So it causes us to repent, it causes us to evangelize. It is um, the subject of Romans chapter 11, which some of you thought I would never get to. We're going to. Remember, Romans chapter 9 was the past uh, condition of Israel. Romans chapter 10 was the present condition as Paul wrote this book of Romans. And Romans 11 is the future, as I have been talking about through this introduction, uh, state of Israel. And along the way, we get some applicational points and an expositional outline. So what I'm going to do, I hope it's not boring to you, is read the entire chapter and then we'll discuss it. So follow along in your Bibles with me, please, to Romans chapter 11. Verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? We're talking about Israel. Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed your people saying, or your prophets and torn down your altars and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what does the divine, divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace, but it is of works. It is no longer grace. Otherwise, works is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. To this very day, as David says, let their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness... For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. 
For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, the root supports you. You will say, then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God, and on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also being cut off, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, Out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Least you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. This is talking about national Israel. A prophecy that was ambiguous in the past, made clear, in in other words, a mystery made clear in the New Testament. A mystery is not something hard to understand. It's something that was not clearly revealed, and now is being clearly revealed. That the entire nation of Israel in a future state, national Israel, will receive Jesus Christ. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. In other words, the prophecy uh, in the Old Testament, the prophecy in Isaiah, the prophecy in Zechariah, the prophecy in Proverbs, these prophecies that somebody's coming out of Zion, the Messiah is coming out of Jerusalem, he's coming out of Judea, he will cause ungodliness to flee from Jacob. This is what it means. So the mystery is now being made clear in the New Testament. Anytime you see that word mystery, It's clarifying something very clearly, very understandably. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God doesn't change his mind when he makes a promise. The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable, for as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown they also may obtain mercy, for God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Then he goes to praise God after this section of scripture that we've covered over these weeks, Romans 9, 10, and 11, and in seeing the beauty of Jesus Christ, seeing the wisdom of Jesus Christ, seeing the mercy of Jesus Christ, and the patience, the wisdom of his plan, the patience with the nation of Israel, the mercy for a pagan Gentile uh, uh, people, and the love that he has for everyone, Paul worships him to conclude this portion of Scripture, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And he says in this worship, oh, the depth of the riches, both in the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? 
Who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall not be repaid to him? Who has outgiven God? You think God owes you something? He doesn't. You can give a billion shillings, God will still owe you nothing. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Father, please illuminate our understanding in this portion of Scripture. We ask by the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is a long chapter that I've just read. And though these six points will outline it in an expositional way, we could spend weeks in this chapter. We won't do it. In fact, I only got about 15 minutes left, so buckle up. You're on a Kenyan Matatu for the next 15 minutes. Number one, when we want evidence of God's work, we should testify of our life first, our life in Christ, as Paul does here. Notice that Paul, he says... In verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. So as Paul, not just in Romans 9, 10, and 11, which if you're sitting there and you're a visitor, or you've been here for these weeks during this study and you're wondering, why are we talking about the nation of Israel so much? Why, maybe not in a critical way towards me, but you may be asking yourself the question, why does the Word of God talk about Israel so much? And of course, as the introduction of the sermon that I gave, there is prophecy that we need to understand that the Bible is the truth of God's Word, and we see it even in the news today, there is even a greater reason to answer that question. And the reason is that the nation of Israel in their humanity is indicative of all humanity, and that is that we are prone to wander and we are born sinners. And in the same way that the nation of Israel has wandered, they wandered before we did as being the covenant people of God and in the covenant people of God having a longer relationship with God we can learn from their mistakes in all of their wanderings all the way back to the wilderness. That's why he talks about it so much. The nation of Israel wandered away from Yahweh. We get born again as Gentiles come into a relationship and we wander in the same ways that they have for centuries. That's why we're talking about Israel. There, it says how many times in Exodus and even in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, in the book of Hebrews, that Israel is a stiff-necked people. You know why we need to hear that Israel is a stiff-necked people all the time? Because you are a stiff-necked people. And I am a stiff-necked person. And do you know what stiff-necked really is talking about? You guys ever woke up with a stiff neck? And in order to see now, you have to not just turn your neck, which is normally is lucid. You have to turn your whole body. Mm. Oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> and we can, even, we can even see people with stiff necks, can't we? We're like, hey, you got a stiff neck? Yeah. How'd you know? Because you just turned like this, like a robot. The idea of a stiff neck is people who can't see clearly. They can't see clearly. The neck is stiff. They're stubborn. Why do we need to learn about Israel? Because we're like them. We're stiff-necked and stubborn and rebellious. Because we're sinners. Incapable of achieving salvation through the obedience to the commandments of God. Though we try... And though there's Gentile religions that have formed entire religions based on their own works like Islam and Hinduism and all the other religions of the world. Same as Judaism. Refusing the goodness of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why we need to learn about them, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't it interesting that the most verifiable fact of humanity, and that is that we are inherently evil and sinful, is the most denied, argued, philosophical debate in all of human history. Where the world actually believes 
that we are basically good people with failures. And we're not. We're basically bad people who need Jesus Christ to be good and righteous. And so this question, and all of the failures, please listen to this, the, the question in all of the failures of the nation of Israel through all the chapters that we have studied from Romans 1 to 11 have risen up in the hearts and minds of the nation of Israel. And the question is this, because we have rejected God, then God has rejected us. And Paul says, no. I rejected God. I thought I was worshiping him. I wasn't. I rejected Jesus Christ who is God in the flesh, but he still loves me and he still saved me and I am born again. He uses his own testimony. You see, the nation of Israel is doing something, ladies and gentlemen, that is so pr prone to humanity. When we get rejected, what do we do as humanity? We reject. Don't we? Don't, if you feel hurt somebody, by somebody, what do you do? You get mad at them? Frustrated? Offended? You can even ignore their text messages and phone calls? <laughs> have you, have you, and, and then you, it, it, it gets even worse in your frustrations and anger when you're married when you're frustrated with your spouse because you know you got to go home because you live with them. So even if you do ignore their calls, you eventually got to talk to them, don't you? I'm not speaking from personal experience. I'm talking about you people. <laughs> and you just, did you hang up on me? Yeah, I did. Don't ever hang up. <laughs> Rejection. Do not project your nature upon the majestic, beautiful nature of God. Just because we've sinned against him doesn't mean he doesn't love us and wants to receive us and forgive us. And Paul is saying to the nation of Israel, using his own testimony, saying, I rejected God. I'm an Israelite. I blasphemed him. I was throwing Christians in prison. I was complicit in the murder of Stephen without due process. I am born again by the grace of Jesus Christ. You guys who are born again, who've come from different backgrounds, many from uh, uh, confusing times in your life, I've heard so many testimonies you guys know how many people have been born again at Calvary Chapel over these years? We can't even number them. They're more than the members of our church because of how many university students pass through this church. Thousands of people have been born again at this church. Thousands. A lot of them come from university confused. Do you know how many people have come up and said, you know, I entered university excited and then I started partying and my heart got fractured through sexual relationships with multiple people and addiction to, 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 to drunkenness and this and that. And it came to the point where I wanted to commit suicide. And then I was born again. Jesus Christ saved my life. Praise God. If you think for a moment that you don't have power and influence in this world through uh, uh, your testimony, the only thing that will keep you from having power uh, uh, is, keep, the only thing that keeps you from that is keeping your mouth shut. Because if you go up to somebody and says, you know, I was going to commit suicide, and then I discovered that Jesus Christ was going to forgive me of my sins, and he did, you may be telling that to somebody who's going, thinking about committing suicide. I remember uh, not too long ago, one of our worship team ladies, Karen, came on stage and shared her testimony that during university, a medical student, that 
she was contemplating suicide. She wanted to kill herself. And then days later, I was um, just over here at a, at a business, and somebody said, you know, I watched uh, your service. It was our Christmas service. And that lady who said she was going to commit suicide spoke to me because I was going to commit suicide. You don't know what your testimony can do to somebody. It is selfish of you to keep quiet. Many of you have come from very bad churches. I've come from bad, uh, I came from a church that didn't speak the truth entirely. It wasn't as bad as, as a, I mean, many of, guys, how is it that the worst teachers that we have heard for a hundred years are the most popular preachers in Kenya? How is it? How, how, how is it? And, and I'm not going to name a bunch of names. I have in the past, and people always get offended, but I'll name one name, and I don't care if you get offended, because I believe he's demon-possessed, and that's Kenneth Copeland. I actually believe with all of my heart that he is demon-possessed by more than one demon. Have you ever seen his eyes during the... You see that interview? Don't you say that. You're sitting there. This guy has been demon-possessed for many years, probably since he was flying Oral Roberts around in that private jet. And these are the messages being propagated are his. And many of us come from churches like that, don't we? Where we actually walk away talking about how good the preacher is when the preacher just shamed you for not being rich. We walked away talking about how good the preacher is because he has these gifts of oratory when he shamed you for not having enough faith to heal your mother of cancer. And many of you have left those places. You've come into a real knowledge of Jesus Christ as the word of God has been taught according to Romans 10 by a preacher. And you've come into contact with Jesus. He's both in you and, and, and next to you. And he has come to you and he says, I don't care if you're rich. In fact, you're poor, all of you. Poor in spirit. And, and, and it's not about the f big faith to go and cure cancer. People are going to die. It's just a way of life. It's the curse of sin. I love you. And I want to forgive you. And I want to be with you. And I want to walk with you. And I, and, and, and I just love you. And then we've been introduced to Christ. Do you think that testimony should be hidden? You go back to those places and you say, I've met Jesus Christ. I know who he is. He's not a God who requires all of these things for me to be loved by him. He's not a God who wants the things that I have. He wants me, a broken, contrite person. And he will not turn me away. That is my God. That is a testimony that the Apostle Paul is sharing with the nation of Israel. We were wrong about him. We were wrong about Yahweh. We were, we were wrong about the Messiah. He came. He died. He rose again. And he loves you. And it's not about works, unless works are, uh, if, if it's of works, then it's not of Christ. And if it's, it's of grace, it's of Christ. And he goes on that repetitive rant. And he says, it's of grace. And isn't it good that it's nothing that I can do, because I can do nothing to earn his favor. I already have it, because he loves me. That's good news. That's a testimony worth sharing, is it not, church? Go share it with people. And I guarantee you, if you share that with people, actually, I think you have been because the result is we need to rip down these walls and build another church across the street with the land God has given us. Because we're sharing that testimony that God is alive. His name is Jesus Christ and he loves you. You can't earn his favor. You already have it because he loves you. 
That's what Paul is doing. He's sharing his testimony. He's a witness of the goodness of Christ. And given the signs and the times that we live in, brothers and sisters, is it not incumbent and imperative upon us to go share our testimonies with people? Go share the truth. Become the salt and the light in Eldoret and beyond. Number two, God does not need numbers to accomplish his work or his works. Notice Paul says, God's not cast us, uh, his people away whom he foreknew. In other words, he foreknew your rebellion when he made the promise that is an everlasting covenant. He knew what was going to happen. And you know what is... Re- uh, just let me get a little doctrinal here, and, and, and I'll step back into the preaching. Let me be, just do the lecture. You know what drives me crazy about those who believe in super cessationism or super uh, of replacement theology that, that God's covenant with Israel is over? First of all, it's like they've never read Romans 11. But Let me ask you this question, and if you've ever dove in deep and you're part of this stupid doctrine, repent. Was that tactful? Just repent. But guys, when God made his covenant with Israel, did God not know that Israel would rebel against him for centuries? That's what Paul is saying. He's saying he knew. He said, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, Abraham, and your descendants, and through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Did he not know that Israel would rebel against him for centuries? Of course he did. He's God. He knows the end from the beginning. And that is the logical, doctrinal point that the apostle Paul is making here. He foreknew. But he goes on and he says, hey, I know There was a time where there was a minority in the nation of Israel that believed, but there was a person who thought he was the only one left. Elijah, he was running from Jezebel, that horrid woman who was just bloodlust and power hungry. And and he says, I'm the only one left. They've killed the prophets. And God says, no, there's a remnant of 7,000 people who are in the nation of Israel who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And there is still a remnant in Israel. But God doesn't need numbers to accomplish his work. Think about this. Who's the apostle to the Gentiles? Paul. Who's the apostle to the Jews? Peter. Paul is a Jew. He's a a scholar of Judaism. And not only is he a scholar of Judaism, he has the highest marks in his educational resume of any person in the nation of Israel. He is the number one student, a Gamaliel scholar. And then, and then you take Peter, and Peter is what? He's a fisherman, not educated formally, didn't go to seminary. He, he, he's a ruffian. He's just a fisherman. He has calluses on his hands. He's a rough guy, big, strong. He can haul 400 pounds of fish to Jesus after the resurrection. And God says, you know, conventional wisdom would say I should make Paul the missionary to the Jews and Peter a missionary to the Gentiles because the Gentiles are uneducated in Judaism and Paul is a scholar of Judaism. But guess what? I don't need Peter for, 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 for the uh, Jew, uh, uh, Gentiles and Paul for the Jews. So I'm going to swap them. Paul's going to be for the Gentiles and Peter for the Jews because I don't need man to accomplish my work. God doesn't need numbers. You know, I hear it all the time. It's like... Uh, Guys, I know I should have learned Swahili by now. And many of you make attempts to teach me all the time, which has become a little annoying. You, sorry. I know, but you guys speak such good English. By the way, most of you speak better English than I do. 
I don't even speak a full language. I tell people I speak half a language. And I say that because English is a big language. Start looking in your encyclopedia and dictionary. There's a lot of words I don't know. Does it make sense that God would send me here a, a, at the age of 23 to start a church that would eventually cause more young people to be born again than any church in this county? No. But guess what? God doesn't need me to start a church here. He doesn't need you. He, God does whatever he wants according to his infinite power and wisdom. He doesn't need numbers. We think, oh, we need, we need a... It, it, I'll never forget this guy that I actually, he was a wolf in our church, but he was a deacon at the time. I didn't know when laying hands on him as a deacon that he was a wolf. So don't judge me. That's God causing a 23-year-old to start a church. I was, and he was like my right-hand guy. He was with me always. And I remember the first time we got a really nice sign outside of Saito Center, um, in which we had the top floor. A really nice sign. You know those signs that are encased in aluminum and they, they have lights on the inside so they light up at night? We like those signs, don't we? And, and um, we got it and it's Calvary Chapel of the Red and it had a scripture on it and it was a big sign and we were waiting for the moment at night when we plugged it in and lit it, it was like... Pfft, and the light came, and we're like, ah, oh, this is nice. And you, I'll never forget what he said to me. He looked at me, and he goes, he goes, now people will come. And I'm like, they're going to come because of the sign and not the word of God? I'll never forget that. I thought, oh, God doesn't need a sign for people to come to his church. I, I, I remember when we were trying to get a, a spot in Pioneer, we ended up pur purchasing a large lease for land, and the land was under dispute. We didn't know. Uh, we came to know when they threatened to throw a tractor over and burn it. So we're there, and, and, and I, I was getting ready to buy a 6,000-seater tent. And when I was buying the tent, somebody from our church said, if we buy the tent, people will come. He goes, why? Because I know the power of the tent. <laughs> That's what he told me. The power of the tent? God needs a tent for people to come to his church. And this is the way that pastors think. This is the way that Christians think. He need, we need a good sound system. Let me tell you, you guys were coming before we had a good sound system. You were coming before we had a nice sign. You were coming before we had a nice band. Why? Because People are hungry for God's word, that's why. And that's the true power of his church, is his word. And, and, and though this building be burnt to the ground, may we be found next Sunday standing on its ashes, singing songs of praise to our God, for he is worthy of worship. God does not need numbers to accomplish his work. Number three, repent before God gives a spirit of stupor. Stupor is an attitude of deadness towards spiritual things. Notice the scripture in verse seven there, verse eight, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. Now, I know we're running out of time, but listen. Back in Romans 9, there is a hyper-Calvinistic view, and notice I'm not saying a Reformed view. Not all Reformed views are the same. It is a hyper-Calvinistic view that, that says that God creates people for hell. That is not consistent with what we have been studying in these three chapters. God, who has power as the potter and creator over the clay, only hardened the heart of Pharaoh after Pharaoh had hardened his heart first, according to the book of Exodus. And remember, in the book of Exodus, 20 times it says that Pharaoh's heart was hard. 10 times he had hardened his heart, and 10 times God has, had hardened his heart. But Pharaoh hardened his heart first. 
that's also consistent with what we're reading here. It's that the nation of Israel first rejected Jesus Christ, and then God, in their rejection, gave them a spirit of stupor they could no longer see clearly. I believe that this happens often, that there is a wrong idea that though God is everlastingly um, in his nature loving, that eventually he will judge a person like Pharaoh or a nation like the nation of Israel and say, I will give you a spirit of stupor. Now, he didn't do it for the whole nation. Paul got saved. But guys, young people especially, but all people, if you think you have time to repent and so you're going to live the life that you want to live now the way you want to live it, that's called rebellion. And you most likely will be more hard-hearted against the spiritual things of God tomorrow if you rebel today. And in some instances, as we see scripturally, God can give you a spirit of stupor. You know, I, I got really sick last weekend. Really sick. Um, you know I couldn't come to church on Sunday, which, guys, if you don't find me preaching on Sunday, I'm, you just assume I'm almost dead because this is my favorite thing in life. And through the week, I remain sick. Today is the first day that I really feel great. Man, during the sickness, my mind wasn't working right. Have you guys ever been so sick, you, get, you ain't thinking clearly? You're all hopped up on medicine? Golly, I have, I'm like a pharmacist. That's how much medicine I had in my house. I'm like, this one is... Kelsey's like, don't mix that one with that one. Sorry, doctor. <laughs> and I remember I had some meetings. One of them was with, uh, I'm, uh, you know, the architect, and I'm, coming up, I'm giving them all these plans for the new church building. Um, it, and we're having this meeting, and we're trying to make these changes and these math problems that need to be solved. And at one point, I, the, there was this long silence because they're waiting for me to, to make a decision on something. And I looked at him and I said, guys, my mind ain't working right. I'm not thinking clearly. I'm really sick. I have this flu. I think we need to postpone this meeting. I'll come tomorrow. Let me go get some rest. And I did that this week. Normally, my mind's firing. When you rebel against God, it's like your mind gets sicker and sicker and it's impossible for you to think straight. If you're in sin, please repent. Number four, do you provoke the unbeliever to jealousy? Notice what it says. Uh, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. I'm going to be real quick because I'm way out of time, but let me just say, if you're not manifesting the fruit of the Spirit you're not glorifying Christ, and you're not causing people through the examination of your life to want to know Jesus Christ. Be patient, be kind, be loving, and provoke people to want to know the God that you serve. Number five, continue in relationship with God. We have a large section here in Romans 11 talking about being grafted in to, as a branch into the olive tree. Understand that that olive tree the foundation is Jesus Christ, but the olive tree is the nation of Israel. And there's actually a rebuke for us, uh, the Gentiles. It's saying, hey, don't make the mistakes that the nation of Israel did because they being a natural branch were cut off and you were added because of your faith in Jesus Christ. But continue in a relationship with Christ and I don't want to get into the debates of once saved, always saved. I don't necessarily think this is talking about the loss of salvation, but that's uh, another matter. However, it is talking about when you become apostate through the rejection or not continuing, the God will cut you off. And don't think for a second that you're 
um, uh, have a greater promise than God's promise with the nation of Israel. God promised the nation of Israel. He promised you salvation. His promises are real. Do not abuse them. And lastly, as the worship team comes up, number six, seeing God's wisdom, Paul, Paul, in seeing God's wisdom in his ways, should cause us to worship him. Did you notice the end of the chapter? When it says beautifully, Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And he goes on, for who has known the mind of God, who has outgiven God. Guys, when we come into the knowledge of Christ, it should cause us to worship him as Paul ends these three chapters with this incredible burst of worship. You know, worship is not excluded to singing songs, but it does include singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It includes obedience, which is the foundation of worship. I don't want to give a teaching on worship, but in regarding to singing songs... And it doesn't mean you're, you know, out dancing, but I can tell the difference between somebody who has the knowledge of Christ and somebody who doesn't. I see it. I see in so many of you a worship of God as we sing songs. Some of it's contemplative, some of it is celebratory, just this excitement. I see it. And many of you, but I also see it in some of you, it's like you've really never come to a knowledge of Christ. And, and, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but when we're singing a song, what he's done, what he's done, my sins are forgiven, my destiny is heaven. Uh, and, and we sing this, I can tell the difference in most cases, I'm probably wrong sometimes, but of people who believe those words because you've come to know Christ. If there is not a song in your heart to worship Jesus Christ, then you are not growing in the grace and knowledge of him. So go share your testimony. God does not need numbers to accomplish his work, both of people or finances. Repent before you get a spirit uh, uh, of stupor. Provoke people to jealousy by bearing the fruit of the spirit. Continue in a relationship with Jesus uh, Christ and through the knowledge of Christ, have a worship of him in your heart. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, as we continue in worship, as we sing this last song and give of our offering, may you receive it according to even what we've heard in Scripture now. Lord, that we can't outgive you. We don't, you don't owe us anything. You're in debt to no one. But we are your bond slaves in debt to you. We are in debt to you, Lord. So we give and we worship and we sing and we love and we cry and we, and we sing with excitement because you are worthy, you are our God and you have forgiven us and you love us. And we worship you in Jesus' name, amen.